What must I do to be saved? That's the question that the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. Very important question because it concerns the salvation of the soul. But it's unfortunate that there are so many people today who seem to be more interested in seeking the teachings and the sayings of men when it comes to salvation than they are in approaching the Word of God to see what God has to say about the matter. One of the most prevalent doctrines in the religious world today surrounds the idea of the sinner's prayer. Recently I logged on to a number of websites to see what these denominational sites had to say not only about salvation but even more specifically the sinner's prayer itself. One particular site that I logged on to gave, the, gave four steps for salvation. I'd like for us to review these very briefly. The first step that it gave is to realize God loves you. And the scripture that it gave for that point is John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that is what that verse teaches, that God loves us. God loves the world. But the second step that it gave is to realize that man is sinful and separated from God because of his sins. The scripture that it gave for that point is Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And certainly that verse teaches that man has sinned. And Isaiah 59 and verse 2 teaches that it is our sins that separate us from God. The third step that it gave is to realize that God sent his son to die for our sins. The scripture that it gave for that point is Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And again, that verse does teach that God sent his son to die for our sins. But then the fourth step that it gave, and it, it just simply made the statement at that point, it said, now to receive God's forgiveness, believe that you are a sinner, believe that Jesus died for your sins, and ask his forgiveness. Then repent. And then the statement was made at that point that what matters most to the Lord is the attitude of your heart. And at that particular point, it went on to say, now say the sinner's prayer. And this is the prayer that it gave. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead. And I trust and follow you all the days of my life. In your name, amen. Now, interestingly, there was no scripture given for that point. There was no scripture given for that prayer. Think about this for a moment. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, the Apostle Peter writes that God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, if God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, then if he requires us to pray a prayer for salvation, then surely we can find it in his word. And surely it will not be difficult to find. Let's look very briefly at three examples of conversion in the book of Acts. Now keep in mind, these are examples of people being converted to Christ. Let's see what they were told to do, and let's see what they did. First of all, there's Acts, the second chapter. This is the day of Pentecost, the day that the Lord's church was established, and this was the very first time that the gospel was preached as directed by Jesus in the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, we read that when the people heard this, that is when they heard the preaching of the gospel regarding the death of Christ and that they were guilty of his crucifixion, they were guilty of his death, they cried out and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's a question. What shall we do? Now, let's look closely at the text to see what Peter told them. In verse 38, then Peter answered and said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. My friends, I don't find anything in that text 
about a sinner's prayer. In fact, I don't find Peter saying anything at all about a prayer whatsoever. The reason is that prayer is one of those blessings that is reserved for one who is a Christian, one who has obeyed the gospel and become a child of God. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, James chapter 5 and verse 16, and other passages. But those people were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now what did they do? In verse 41 we read, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them that same day about 3,000 souls. And so then, when you read that text and you study it, nothing is said about a sinner's prayer. Let's look at another example. In Acts chapter 8, beginning with about verse 26, you read of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. The angel tells Philip to join himself to the chariot of the eunuch, and when he does so, he finds the eunuch reading and studying from the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, prophecies about the crucifixion of Christ. And Philip asked him the question, do you understand what you're reading? And then the eunuch says, how can I, except some man should guide me? And then Philip begins at that same scripture and preaches unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And then the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Then when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he, that is the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. Now my friends, you can read that again, and you will find absolutely nothing said about a sinner's prayer. But you do find where Philip preached unto him Jesus, which obviously included preaching about baptism into Christ, because the eunuch asked, what doth hinder me to be baptized? But we also see that the eunuch rejoiced, not before he was baptized into Christ, but afterward. Let's look at the third example now. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 30. Now again, this is the case of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. The jailer has, has come and he's found Paul and Silas, the prisoners, outside of the prison. They're not in the prison. The prison doors have been jarred open by the earthquake. He's about to kill himself when Paul says, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then the jailer asked the question in verse 30, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now there are many when inquiring about salvation are told, believe on the Lord. And oftentimes people will quote that verse. But you can't simply quote that verse and not go on and continue to read because you're reading of one being converted to Christ. If so if you stop with verse 30, you stop before the man has been converted. And not only, not only that, but if you have the man, and look if you will at verse 31. He asked, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you have him saved at verse 31, You've got him saved before he's ever heard the word. Because verse 32 says, They, that is Paul and Silas, spake unto him the word of the Lord. Keep reading. In verse 33, Then he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, indicating repentance, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. That is, immediately. Now again, you look at that text and you see absolutely nothing that is said about a sinner's prayer. Paul does not tell him, pray in order to be saved. Well, the subject of our, this particular series is in the form of a question, what does the Bible say? So, what does the Bible say about the sinner's prayer? The answer is nothing, absolutely nothing nothing. I mentioned to you a moment ago, toward the beginning of the study, 
that one of the statements on that website is simply was, what matters to the Lord most is the attitude of your heart. Is there anything else that matters to the Lord? I believe there is. Look at Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Jesus was saying, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So it's important to the Lord that one does his will, that one obeys him. Look at Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. The Hebrew writer said, Though he, that is Christ, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Look at this now. Unto all them that obey him. Unto all them that pray to him? No. Unto all them that say a sinner's prayer? No. Unto all them that obey him. Him. John writes in Revelation 22 and verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. It is so very important when it comes to the salvation of the soul that we do not take the words of men, but take the word of God. And if you're taught anything, regarding salvation, regarding spiritual matters. Look to the Word of God to see if the Bible teaches it. And again, what does the Bible say about the sinner's prayer? Absolutely nothing. I'm Jimmy Ferguson of the Southside Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Thank you for viewing this study.